we're so lucky to have these amazing musicians at UCC. So good morning to everyone. Um, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Coastside community. I'm Noreen Cooper Hevelin, and I will be your worship associate for today, along with David Rudiger and Bill Hevelin. And a very warm, warm welcome for those of you who are visiting for us for the first time. We're small enough we can pick you out. <laughs> and however you describe yourself, whomever you love, whatever your abilities or what sparks age, path, travel, it's all good. We're happy you're here. And know that you are most welcome here. Um, each of you presenting an intrinsically beautiful miracle within our midst. And here we honor the personal flame which helps you to blossom spiritually, build community, work for social justice, and repair the world. And as Linda and I were talking a little earlier today, just put some more good into the world. It's nice to be reminded of that, even if it's just once a month. <laughs> Okay, after all, what good is being part of a spiritual community if it does not teach you how to give and receive more love? Today, we warmly welcome back Reverend Stephanie Etzbach Dale to the UUC's pul pulpit with a sermon entitled Love Exposed. And we are in the season of the high holy days in the Jewish tradition and Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur ended uh, last Monday, and Sukkot is now being celebrated through Sunday on Saturday. And Reverend Stephanie will inspire us on how the healing power of love is expressed during this important Jewish holiday. Thank you, Noreen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is my first time in the Odd Fellows Hall, and it's wonderful to be here with you. We're at the, at the turning point of the seasons right now, so I chose a reading by Jack Reamer, which is printed in your order of service, but we're going to read it together and just encourage you to, to let the words resonate, to fall where they will inside you and to allow them to resonate for you. And I will begin. Now is the time for turning. The leaves are beginning to turn from green to red to orange. The birds are beginning to turn and are heading once more toward the south. The animals are beginning to turn for to storing their food and for winter. For leaves, birds, animals, turning comes instinctively. But for us, turning does not come too easily. It takes an act of will for us to make a turn. It means breaking with old habits. It means admitting that we have been wrong, and that is never easy. It means losing face. It means starting all over again, and this is always painful. It means saying, I'm sorry. It means recognizing that we have the ability to change. These things are hard to do. But unless we turn, we are trapped forever in yesterday's ways. God, help us to turn from callousness to sensitivity, from hostility to love, from pettiness to purpose, from envy to contentment, from carelessness to discipline, from fear to faith. Turn us around, O oh God, and bring us back toward you. Revive our lives as at the beginning. And turn us toward each other, God, for in isolation, there is no life. <clears throat> and now we'll honor Yom Kippur with today's chalice lighting. The chalice lighting for Yom Kippur is by Reverend Vanessa Rush Southern. This chalice lighting is a ritual that unites us as Unitarian Universalists. And due to fire regulations, this particular chalice glows from battery power. <laughs> Our chalice lighting words uh, today, if you join me. We light our chalice, symbol of our faith, 
For truth sought through a questioning heart and attentive mind. And for love pursued through obstacles inside and outside our human heart. And for forgiveness and all it entails, the place, the place where truth and love meet and merge. we're not a singing congregation. <laughs> we have this on tape now. <laughs> so it is with my great pleasure to introduce Reverend Stephanie Etzbach Dale, who is affiliated with the UU Church of Palo Alto. Most recently, she served as pastoral care minister for UU San Mateo while offering creative Torah studied sessions at Congregation Beth Jacob in Redwood City. In her spiritual direction practice, she focuses on building spiritual courage, resilience, and joy through private spiritual direction sessions, group retreats, and workshops, public speaking, and art. She's really a very talented artist. If you get a chance, you should follow her Facebook page. It's uh, pretty amazing, the artwork she puts out. To find out more, please visit her website at tendingspirit.com. Reverend Stephanie. Thank you very much. It is a joy to be with you all again and to see some familiar faces. Lovely to be in this space. So this month's theme, I was told, is love. And I was a little surprised because very often love is associated with February. But the fact is, love is a timeless theme. Love is a theme that should be woven through every month, every week. So I'm at this transition point in my life right now, in particular with my professional life. And so I was thinking about what I love most about my ministry, which again is, is changing, it's turning a bit. And what I've loved most about it is that it has allowed me to get to know and to accompany so many amazing people who are seeking to move thoughtfully through the liminal spaces of life, to move thoughtfully through life's challenges and opportunities between one identity and the next, between one life stage and the next, between the realm of questions and the realm of possibilities. So along those lines, 
A while back, I was approached by a young, newly engaged couple sorting through their hopes, their expectations, and fears around marriage, wanting to have their wedding be about more than just the fancy outfits and the venue and the cake. They committed to putting those particular details on hold for a while, for several months actually. We met to focus on how they can identify and articulate what it is that they're really feeling, what's motivating them to come together in marriage and what their concerns are, what they want that life lived in love to look like and what they want it to mean and feel like. And then allow those details to, to guide the ritualistic culinary and aesthetic details of their special day if there was indeed to be one. So they sat together very sweetly, holding hands, and they said, we love each other and we do want to build a life together. But sometimes we struggle with whether marriage is even a relevant or helpful construct these days. They pondered whether the process of planning a wedding would would change, would somehow damage the love that they sought to celebrate. Would planning a wedding strain their relationship, their family ties, their finances? Would it jeopardize what they hold most dear, namely the love that they have already professed to one another? It has been known to happen Planning weddings can be a really tough thing, straining not just the couple, but the extended <laughs> families. So they wanted to hear from me whether and how their wedding could be designed in such a way that it would assure that it is experienced as transformational in the best possible way, solidifying their commitments and bringing joy to everyone present, whether witnessing or participating. I loved that they cared enough to even think about such things because so many couples get caught up in like, what color are the tablecloths going to be? Right? So I could have gone into problem solving with them at that point, but I had a sense that there was something really significant underneath those particular questions. So, so I deflected and asked them some more questions. I asked them, who are your role models for love and, and for marriage? Are those healthy and happy relationships or not? And, and how can you tell? How can you actually tell? What are the signs of love thriving, love thriving in a committed relationship? We talked through familial and societal expectations around weddings and around marriages. We talked about things they didn't want to talk about, like money and chores, about rage and, and conflict resolution. We talked about intimacy and fidelity, the pros and cons. We talked about children, pros and cons. We talked about pets, definitely pros. We talked about <laughs> support systems. We talked about spiritual practices. We talked about shared long-term goals and values and, and the dreams that they don't share as a couple but are, are very much willing to support for each other's individual well-being. Over the course of several months, it became clear to me that at the root of their many philosophical and pragmatic questions and responses, there were some deeply ingrained, deeply personal, primal, and extraordinarily common existential fears around love, particularly their worthiness of it their worthiness of it on both the giving and the receiving end of things. So a big part of my job, as I saw it, was to help them find the, the words to, to express these fears and, 
And then to muster up the courage to expose them, to expose those fears in the name of love. What I heard can be summed up like this. What if I can't keep my vows? What if I can't live up to them? What if I, what if I fail to provide for us, practically speaking or, or emotionally? Will my beloved be able to step up, be there for me and for us in the ways that I need them to be so that, so that we can have security and stability in our lives? Because right now, I'm the more practical one and take care of those things. Well, what if that doesn't work? Will they resent me if there's a shift of responsibilities? Will they think less of me? And what if my beloved fails? to live up to those vows and promises. And then, in the process, jeopardizes our future together, our family. Am, am I actually better off alone? Are they better off alone? What if I disappoint? What if I can't live up to my end of things because of something that's completely beyond my control? Like, what if I get sick or I get fired and I don't have an income? I mean, what then? And here's where we hit the hidden core. Will I still be loved? Will, will they leave me? Will I end up alone after all, after all that? What is the point even of, of making vows and promises when there are no guarantees that we can live up to them? What indeed? The air thickened with the terror that had finally been named. A terror that I would hazard to say has defined the human condition since the evolution of consciousness. The fact is most of us, most of us walk around terrified. No matter how well put together we are, no matter how much we may smile and be confident in certain areas of our lives, underneath all of that there is a terror. And I speak from experience, my own, there is terror. There's terror for, of being exposed as, as less than in perfect control of everything. There is terror of rejection and abandonment, of, of not being worthy of someone else's love. There is terror of disappointing others. There is terror even when we smile. There is terror even when we make plans and when we make promises and vows. There is terror even when we sign the mortgage papers, especially when we sign the mortgage papers. <laughs> Ooh, most of us yearn to feel confident, to feel safe and secure in this world, to live in comfort and in simplicity and, and with predictability. And from generation to generation, we do find ways to live our lives and to, to weave our lives around that particular yearning, around that hope. Now, ideally, ideally, we have been raised in love and safety. Ideally, deep down, we do feel reasonably secure in the presence of those we love and those who proclaim to love us. Ideally, we learn over time to trust love even more and to draw near to those who affirm and protect us and, and to offer our own love and protection. But there are at least two problems, at least two problems with these ideal scenarios. The first is that far too many of us do not experience that ideal too many of us grow up in neglect and abuse. We learn the hard way 
not ever to, to feel or to expect safety or, or love from other human beings. And all too often, we learn not to trust others at all. And instead, we seek security in self-sufficiency with hypervigilance, seeking to avoid the vulnerabilities of exposure that comes with love and to control whatever else we can actually manage to control. And in the process, life gets really small and it loses its flexibility and its curiosity and its ability to connect and to grow. The thing is that even under the best of circumstances, there is far too much in life that is beyond our control, beyond anyone's control to, to predict, to avoid, to manage. Even the greatest mutual devotion cannot empower one who is loved to feel utterly secure or one who loves to guarantee it. We cannot guarantee it as much as we want to. We cannot guarantee it which means exposure to the possibility of failure, the possibility of disappointment, of frustration, regret, and existential fear. These are always possibilities when we open ourselves to love. So bearing witness to the desire that this young couple had for, for predictability, for me to promise them that they would have a blissful life shared in love. Their desire for a wedding that, that really felt spiritually transformational, like there would always be a before and after feeling, right? My heart ached for them. Because while there are self-awareness and self-regulation and communication skills that can help couples anticipate and move through the inevitable tough times, and while there are spiritual rituals that can help facilitate transformational, heart-opening experiences, the fact is, in matters of love, there can be no guarantees. Certainly not in terms of what life is going to throw at them. Nobody can predict that. Not in terms of how what gets thrown at them might change the way they move in the world, and then not in terms of how those changes affect their ability to trust and stay rooted in the power of love. To grow in deeper appreciation of its endless expressions and, and meanings and sacred potential. So I surmised that, that they really didn't want to hear that, that they really weren't ready to hear that. So, so I turned to the spiritual <coughs> resources that are available to me, hoping to find something that would place their, their personal fears within a larger context and, and give them the courage to say yes to love despite its uncertainties. Because I felt that they were actually pretty great together. <laughs> I thought they had a really good shot. <laughs> They were so spiritually grounded and, and self-aware and harmonious and so very determined to live with integrity and to bring joy to one another, to help each other connect with joy. So we had already had conversations about their, their worldview, their theology, and I knew that the context of a living God who would see them through whatever may lie ahead was not one they could relate to. So I steered clear of it, and I thought about the timeless metaphor of, of nature's abundance, which is a larger context, right, that holds us, the cycles and seasons that remind us when we personally are in chaos that there is still a grand order to things, the seasons will turn, the new day will come. That metaphor has been a perennial favorite for clergy types. But it doesn't take much to realize that it doesn't have the same potency it once did. 
climate change has changed the way we relate to this larger context of the natural world of the cycles and seasons. So it occurred to me then that the Jewish celebration of Sukkot was coming up. And again, it actually started on Friday and it lasts a full week. Sukkot follows Yom Kippur, which is the most sacred, most somber holiday in the year. It is a time to connect with shortcomings, with the things that we didn't do so well in the past year, where we may have caused harm. It's a time to come to terms with our mortality and to think about how do we really want to show up in the world. So it's a heavy holiday, right? Sukkot comes right after that. And Sukkot is the most joyful holiday. It's meant to keep alive the memory of the Israelites' 40 years of desert wanderings after being liberated from slavery and before having entered the land promised to them. So it's meant to keep alive the memory of liminality, the space between this and that. It draws attention to the space in between, that space of uncertainty. Those who observe this holiday build temporary, fragile shelters through which both the sunlight and the starlight can shine, through which the wind can blow, through which rain can actually fall. Entire families and communities gather in these shelters for a whole week, exposed to the unpredictabilities of weather, to eat and study and pray and sing and sometimes even sleep. Perhaps you're already guessing why this came to mind in relation to this young couple. But first, it's important to say that for the religiously observant, the intentional fragility of these structures, the temporary nature of these structures is pointed to as highlighting two main things. First is the inherent fragility uncertainty, danger, and temporality of being human. Those structures remind us that being human is also temporary and fragile. And for those who observe, again, it also points to the utter dependence on that mysterious larger context that we cannot possibly wrap our minds around, which some people call God. So there are lots of other meanings that can be associated with this. For me, in thinking of this young couple, I felt moved to connect with meanings that would be accessible to them as a couple who struggle with the idea of a God who, whose acts of liberation preference one people over another people. I, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> but here's what I saw fit to share with them. To build on the first point, the inherent fragility and uncertainty and danger of being human. Sukkot reminds us that being human, whether you believe in God or not, whether you use that language or not, does mean being subject to all sorts of unpredictabilities, even as we make and receive vows. Sukkot is actually experienced by, by many people as a kind of wedding, a week-long wedding celebration, the location of which reinforces that despite our highest intentions, there are all sorts of things beyond our control because love exposes us. Love exposes us. We can as little guarantee someone else's comfort and security as expect them to be fully responsible for our own. So the message is let us love one another as best we can. Let us celebrate love. And if it starts raining, we'll deal with that when it happens. <laughs> The shelters erected for Sukkot year after year are a powerful metaphor for the larger context of life itself, which is mysterious and fragile and temporary. It is a liminal space. 
defined for each and every one of us by the mysterious uncertainties that arise between birth and death. These are in and of themselves mysteries. Life has no guarantees, but it is worth it. Like a sukkah, life itself is a fragile space in which uncertainties, vulnerabilities, and fears can and do arise and become exposed all the time. So it behooves us, I said to them, it behooves us to draw near, and I don't use that, all, that word very often, behooves us. <laughs> it behooves us to draw near to one another within life's fragile walls, however temporary, however not to code they might be, however unpredictable. Let us draw near to one another and create for one another as much comfort and and support as possible for as long as possible until the, wane, the rains come in and the wind blows. Thinking of this couple's desire for a transformational wedding ceremony, I remembered that Rabbi Alan Liu of the Institute for Jewish Spirituality wrote that transformation requires that we be willing to enter a realm beyond the one we usually occupy. So that's what I invited this couple to do, to let go of their focus on seeking security within the realm of certainty, to be willing to enter the realm of vulnerability, of uncertainty, of exposure together day by day, year by year. The wedding is set for two weeks from today. <laughs> I don't know what color the tablecloths are. <laughs> With hearts opened and exposed in love, my wish for them is that they long draw near to one another in joy and in awe and in gratitude for life's precious fragility and the privilege of finding one another and being able to share love. And may we likewise draw near this day and every day to one another and, and to the love that, that holds aloft the heavens, at least for the time being, and turns the seasons and opens and transforms human hearts. So may it be. service today and I want to thank um, those of you um, especially that participated in our, our sermon chair and Reverend Stephanie I also want to express my gratitude for your uh, sermon today um, for exposing love today and for connecting it to Sukkot and its tradition of hospitality and to Sukkot I shall return Today I speak against bullying. In part, this is a direct response from Coast Pride's multi-faith partners. 
Among the risk factors for being bullied, one risk factor is not presenting as heteronormative. I've recently learned that this term, non-heteronormative. And in part, I want to add my own voice to recognizing that bullying has consequences for some people in my life, people dear to me in my life. And in part, I speak to pour more love into the world. Let us define bullying. Roles. There's the bully. There's the bully's victim. And quite often, there are bystanders, witnesses, the bully's audience, willing or unwilling. And there is a power imbalance. The bully and the bully's witnesses, that group collectively has more power than the victim. Four kinds of behavior can be bullying. Physical abuse, like hitting and shoving. Verbal abuse, like name calling. Social exclusion and rumor mongering. Bullying consists of any of these behaviors by someone with more power. And the holiday of Sukkot inspires this response to bullying. Asuka. The singular form of Sukkot is the tent which, in, into which guests are honorably invited. An emerging response to bullying is the support group method, SGM, of Robinson and Mainz, once called the no blame approach. Bullies and witnesses are invited um, to, into a council's room, Asuka, really. Hey, there's been this incident. What do you know about it? How did it make you feel? How did it make the victim feel? What do you suggest we do to keep it from happening again? And into another counselor's room, another Asuka, the victim is invited. Hey, there's been this incident. What do you know about it? How did it make you feel? What kind of help do you need so it doesn't happen again? These conversations take place at hospitable tables. Questions are not, the questions are not asked across the table, interrogation style. They're not asked with blame. They are asked from the same side of the table, friend style, ally style, and with follow-up. How's it all working out? And unlike punishing the bully, which mirrors uncomfortably the bully versus victim power dynamic, this series of Sukha SGM conversations model something else. Collaborative relationships as an ideal adult behavior. And research shows SGM works pretty well, particularly after follow-up. And in a curious or perhaps deliberate symmetry with Sukkot, SGM actually has seven steps, like the seven days of Sukkot. Sukkot's hospitality, Sukkot's love, exposes an ideal for all of us to grow into, to grow in empathy, to grow in empathic action, to pour more love into the world. And that's why we're here, why we come back and why we follow up. Thanks to all of you for entering our sukkah today up here in Odd Fellows Hall. And to donate by check, 
Those instructions are in the order of service. The main thing is to make out the check to UUSM, the UUs of San Mateo, while noting UUCC in the memo field. I'll put the link in the chat. And as you lovingly uncap your pens and unfold your checkbooks, Diedrich has selected an anti-bullying anthem, I Am Enough, by the pop vocal group um, Chima Rey. On the third page of the order of service, you can follow the lyrics while Diedrich plays this inspirational song. So now we extinguish uh, the chalice. Um, please read with me. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. There is more love somewhere. It's very simple. Four verses. There is more love somewhere. There is more hope somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. Peter, uh, are you, do we have a uh,
closing words, I share with you an adaptation of the piece that I found in our hymnal. It is said that to laugh is to risk appearing the fool, and to weep is to risk appearing sentimental. It is said that to reach out for one another is to risk exposing our true self and to place our ideas and our dreams before others is to risk loss. It is said that to love is to risk not being loved in return and to hope is to risk despair. It is said that to try is to risk failure and to live is to risk dying. To this I add, not to laugh, not to weep, not to reach out in vulnerable authenticity, not to love or to hope or to try is not to live. And so as we move further into this day and the new week and month ahead, may we each live fully and gratefully, mindful of the precious fragility that gives us shelter and the warmth and joy that we can and must bring to one another within it. So may we go in peace, move in love, and be a light unto the world. Blessed be.